Welcome everyone. Today I'm going to be reading from the prologue, or rather the Vorreden of uh, from Also Sprach Zarathustra from Friedrich Nietzsche. Thus spoke Zarathustra by Friedrich Nietzsche. I will be reading from the third Vorrede and from the fourth, but mainly from the fifth on the last man. And as I often get asked these days now how to support or contribute to my work, I'm, it's always possible to send gifts via PayPal or Bitcoin if you desire. And that helps make this possible. But what also helps me make this possible is if you enroll in courses and if you want to study Nietzsche in more depth, this prophet of late modernity, then you can enroll in my course with the link just down below. And there are seven lectures, about eight hours or so in total um, that you can listen to, which are not available publicly and will not be available publicly. In the third prologue, Zarathustra says, Ich lehre euch den Übermenschen. I teach you the overman. And it is now translated as overman, this word, which was before translated as superman, because overman indicates that the, that the Übermensch is the one who goes over and beyond himself. And over and beyond the human being in his current most prevalent form, which is the last man. And the last man, I will say a few things after I read the fifth uh, prologue, the fifth speech of the prologue. However, the last man is not weak. There is a certain force about him, even a certain strength, but one that is rather wretched because they are, as he says in German, Verächter des Lebens, Absterbende und selber Vergiftete, deren die Erde müde ist. So mögen sie Dahin fahren. They are, in fact, those who are tired of life and they despise life. They are the ones who are demising and they are themselves poisoned, poisoning the earth, tired. The earth itself is tired of them because they are the ones who flatten the earth. But as Zarathustra says here, that the overman, the Übermensch, shall be the meaning of the earth. So he says, remain faithful to the earth because the last men are despisers of life, dying off and self-poisoned, of whom the earth is weary. So let them fade away. Who is it that Zarathustra addresses with the overman? He is here in the city, the bunte Kuh, the colored or colorful cow. And as I continue to read some of these chapters or songs rather by odes by from the Zarathustra, I will come to, I think, what is one of the most important chapters, which is on vom Vorübergehen, on passing by. But now here, who is the Overman? What is great about human beings is that they are a bridge and not a purpose. What is lovable about human beings is that they are a crossing over and going under. And this is who helps prepare the Overman, this other way of being of being f human in a sense, in a way that is beyond the 
metaphysical representation of the human being as a rational animal, but also beyond the Christian understanding of the human being, and also beyond the liberal understanding of the human being, which is birthed simply from Christianity. What happens in philosophy with Nietzsche is that philosophy or thinking becomes demanding and also forward-looking towards a philosophy of the future. Of the future, not necessarily as the future as an object, but of the future as the subject, which reveals something of itself in philosophy, so that philosophy or thinking begins to show of what it is that is in store for us. Because as Nietzsche says, what is in store for us inevitably, this is in one of the posthumously published notes from the late 1880s, is, as he says, quote, the unvermeidlich bevorstehende Wirtschaftsgesamtverwaltung der Erde, which is in English the, um, the total economic management of the earth, which is inevitably in store for us today, inevitably. But in the same note, he says, that this will generate an overflow of a certain type of human being, by which he certainly does not mean any of the visible, those will not be visible types, but an overflow of the artistic creative man who is capable to stand on and outside the wheelwork. We must not, we should not look for them somewhere up the ladder, uh, such as we shouldn't look for the overman somewhere in the ruling castes, but rather perhaps a bit on the outskirts. Here is who Zarathustra loves. I love the one whose soul is overfull, so that he forgets himself, and all things are in him. Thus all things become his going under. I love the one who is free of spirit and heart. His, thus his head is only the, en the entrails of his heart, but his heart drives him to his going under. And I love all those who are likely, who are like heavy drops, falling individually from the dark cloud that hangs over humanity. They herald the coming of the lightning, the blitz, the flash, and as heralds, they perish. And he is, Zarathustra, he says of himself, the herald of the flash, the splitzes, the flash of Heraclitus. So I'm now going to read most of the fifth speech in Zarathustra's prologue. When Zarathustra had spoken these words to the people in the city, he looked again at the people and fell silent. There they stand, he said to his heart. They laugh. They do not understand me. I am not the mouth for these ears. Must one first smash their ears so that they learn to hear with their eyes? Must one rattle like kettle drums and penitence preachers? Or do they believe only a stutterer? They have something of which they are proud. And what do they call that which makes them proud? Education, they call it. Bildung in German. It distinguishes them from goat herds. For that reason they hate to hear the word contempt applied to them. So I shall address their pride instead. Thus I shall speak to them of the most contemptible person. The most contemptible is the last man or the last human being. The letzte Mensch who is the last man. I'll say it again, those who are tired of life, despisers of life, of which even the earth is weary. Those who want to, at once, in a wretched way, maintain their comfort, but also get rid of the human being entirely, anything that makes us human, especially suffering. And it is always spoken in a most 
compassionate voice, highly moralistic, a call for an end to suffering, which is often a call for an end to human beings or human life. So Zarathustra spoke to the people, it is time that mankind set themselves a goal again. It is time that mankind plant the seed of their highest hope. Their soil is still rich enough for this, but one day this soil will be poor and tame, and no tall tree will be able to grow from it any more. Beware, the time approaches when human beings no longer launch the arrow of the long beyond the human, and the string of the bow will have forgotten how to wear. I say to you, one must still have chaos in oneself in order to give birth to a dancing star. I say to you, you still have chaos in you. And chaos, this old Greek word, means abyss, yawning, gap, from out of which the world is generated. If and only if there is chaos that can be ordered, but it is without subsuming or consuming or destroying the chaos that the most beautiful world begins to shine forth if the abyss is allowed its ways also. If it is attempted to be calculated away, what is the inevitable result is an as anarchies of of a matrix chaos which cannot provide an ethos, a dwelling ground for mortal man. Beware the time approaches when human beings will no longer give birth to a dancing star, but only to a sterile and dead, hygienized world, clean and locked in. Beware, the time of the most contemptible human being is coming. The one who can no longer have contempt for himself. Behold, I show you the last human being. What is love? What is creation? What is longing? What is a star? Thus asks the last human being, blinking. In German, so fragt der letzte Mensch und blinzelt. What is this blinking, this blinzeln? Then the earth has become small, and on it hops the last human being who makes everything small, his kind, his ilk, is ineradicable, like the flea beetle. The last human being lives longest. We invented happiness. Invented, not found, invented, say the last human beings blinking, blinking to each other. They abandoned the regions where it was hard to live for one needs warmth. One still loves one's neighbor and rubs up against him for one needs warmth. Becoming ill and being mistrustful are considered sinful by them. One proceeds with caution. A fool who still stumbles over stones or humans, a bit of poison once in a while, that makes for pleasant dreams. And much poison at the end, for a pleasant death, God beware, we die a natural death. Oh, the suffering, oh, the horror. One still works, for work is a form of entertainment. But one sees to it that the entertainment is not a strain, or no longer becomes poor and rich. Both are too burdensome. Who wants to rule any more? Who wants to obey any more? Both are too burdensome, and hence we have a managerial caste with no responsibility, an administrative caste, and a bureaucratic caste, and a technocratic caste. No shepherd, but one herd. Each wants the same, each is the same. All are equal, rather, is the better translation. And whoever feels differently goes voluntarily into the insane asylum. 
Who is the last man? Wer ist der letzte Mensch? The letzte Mensch, the last man, is the one who will not even become as much as a camel. As you might know, in the prologue, Zarathustra tells of the image, of the metaphor of the camel that transforms into a lion, and the lion transforms into a child, and the child finally is free. But no, the last man must be found in his questions. He's the flea beetle, the Erdfloh, who levels the earth, who flattens the earth, who reduces human spirit and creation to a standstill that can be controlled and mechanically managed and steered. And the last man blinks. What is this blinking? He doesn't know love, he doesn't know creation, and he doesn't know longing, and he doesn't know star. That is not important. These are not really questions. These are rhetorical questions. These are questions that, in blinking, are asked, <laughs> why should we care about a question for true creation and human creativity, or longing, and longing for the stars, but on the earth? This blinking, dieses sich gegenseitig zublinzeln, blinking to each other, is the MO, the way in which the last, last human being, the last man, operates. Of course, there are here echoes of Plato's cave, of the sun, of this initial blinking when the pain of seeing truth, the true light of the good for the first time, hits upon the one who was freed from the cave. But the last man is not the one who seems to be freed from anything or who seems to be want to be freed. So perhaps, even though there are echoes here of this blinking, this does not fully capture it. Because here there is no initiation into truth or star or sun or a longing for a higher and higher ideal. Quite the opposite. There's an immediate turning away from it. And this blinking then is not just an involuntary blinking, which just so happens because it is too bright. No. This is a voluntary blinking. This is a blinking to each other. It's more like this. It is an agreement. It is an agreement with each other that we do not have to overcome ourselves. It is an agreement with each other, with one another, that we have agreed already what the human being is, namely a consumer, a big grey mass. And that the niveau reduction, the reduction in the niveau of the human being, is already agreed upon, and anyone who dares speak out against it is a threat. There might also be a connection between the last man and the last god of which Heidegger speaks. But here we do not find really, I think, a weakness of the will in the last human being, do we? There is rather, it seems, no weakness. There is perhaps, one could say, a weakness because they do not want to speak in the language of Nietzsche, a new, a creation of new life-affirming values. But to some degree they are affirming the last human being. So they are affirming their end state, their consumer beetle nothingness. But this isn't really a destructive, a, a purposefully destructive nihilistic will either. It's, it, it is too weak for this kind of a strong nihilism that would tear down everything in order to rebuild and deliver over what is worthy of delivering over. There is here a will that is at work, but it isn't a weak will. It is the, the self-organizing and also self-habituating uh, uh, will 
of last humanity is to organize oneself voluntarily, willingly, with one's will towards, or this is a voluntary suppression of the will and there is a an organization and bureaucratization that works only towards this and there's even a distribution you could say of mechanisms of suppression and weakening of those instincts that are truly life-affirming and life-inspiring that inspire greatness in art in poetry in thought in architecture in anything that is beyond just the mass management of the herd. So there is a will at work here and this is not uh, a weak will. So maybe the wretched will is not right either. There is some sort of a will that is actually quite focused. It's not weak. It's not unclear what it wants. It, it's exactly, it knows exactly what it wants. It wants to be blinking to each other in, and this is important, in a self-reflective reflexive way it ref they ref the last human beings reflect this to each other they blink to each other pointing out to each other that it is already decided it's already certain who and what we are it's already certain what the world is and that history has ended etc etc and that all we need now is just one more form one more mechanism to control ourselves so that God forbid no more creative impulse could ever come but it will come in a very compassionate voice it will come in the voice of the moralist who will cry for the suffering of the human being the suffering must end the terrible suffering of giving birth for example the terrible suffering of of a natural death God forbid the last man blinks to each other and with this blinking blinks away the painful truth of existence. But it is this painful truth that could give rise to the greatest, the greatest inspiring artworks again. In this reflective and reflexive and um, of, a, of a pure reflex blinking which already knows everything. It can be found anywhere. It can be found even especially there where there's supposedly some form of criticism or critique where perhaps there is a call for you to stay at home and perhaps where there is a call for you to stay at home and clean your room where there is this kind of a call um, for you uh, to not aspire to anything beyond yourself but to follow certain rules there's a blinking there's a blinking there which is a very perverted <laughs> wheelwork an uncanny wheelwork he says Nietzsche and the same notes I mentioned from before is upon us and the total economic management of the earth which produces its own inherent critics that's how dialectics always works. So the despisers of life and those who denigrate it, those who actually denounce life and those who are perhaps even worse, uh, who betray life and who betray danger, and who betray and do not want and want to eradicate anything that is ungefähr, that is unavailable, non-controllable, dangerous, that is ambiguous, is then put under control and optimization mechanisms or operations which are themselves mad but there is a strength to this will it's not weak the last man is not weak at all the last man lives longest as Nietzsche says 
And it is the human being himself who is being rebuilt, reconstructed, as it were, rethought here. The last man lives longest, Nietzsche says, in their comfort, their supposed comfort. They are not dead themselves, perhaps, but they move only on the dead swamps of comfort in a complete forgetting of what is worthy to be delivered over into the future. There is no stance here taken, but this non-stance is one that is ultimately violent of a very, very sinister violence, because it is a non-visible violence. It's barely sensible. But this strength should be taken seriously. There's no weakness here. There's a weakness in terms of not wanting to create higher values, yes, but there's a strength in not wanting to create, in this will of not wanting to create, which is actually a destructive one. And Nietzsche warns of not destruction, which can be creative, but of desertification, where the human being just ends in a desert of himself, of his own creation. But perhaps we should also note that in any desert, there is always an oasis. And even if the last man lives longest, there's always a fool who stumbles outside the cave at some point. <laughs>